important, the last one, the sphere being alliance. David, help me out here. Well, now we're into an even more bizarre category. Uh, and I will just say to start out that if you go back to the Egyptian and Sumerian paintings and inscriptions and statues, you see images of humans with bird-like heads. That's right. And typically this is just seen as a totem that we are being shown ritual images that are not based on anything real. But why are these people being drawn right beside humans that look like us? And in what appears to be just an open acknowledgement that there were beings that looked like that back then. Well, we also have, as I said in Endgame Part 2, we have the bird tribes in Native American culture in which they are clearly depicted as humans with bird-like faces. And another really fascinating thing is the Tengu, the birdmen in Japan, in which I've dug up already at least two images that you can see on my website, and there's plenty more, of people that are human-looking with a blue appearance, again, the blue color, and they have a bird-like face. And we see from William Henry images of uh, Horace in which he's painted blue, right. as if he had blue-colored, if he was a bird, he would have blue-colored feathers. So then fast forward to the, the big, big breakthrough for me was I found out UFOs are real right in this little town that I'm staying in, in in upstate New York right now when this all started for me. And that was when I was going to college and I found out that NASA was covering up the truth. I spent basically three, four years doing nothing but researching UFOs in all of my available free time. I read over 300 books by the time I graduated college. And... <clears throat> Eventually, I found this material called the Law of One. And I thought I'd become quite knowledgeable. Oh, did we lose you, David? Oh, man. I think... I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. There you are. Whew. Okay. The Law of One. Yeah, we're talking on a landline, by the way. Yeah. There is nothing going on here. We are not on a cell phone. This is a landline. Yeah, that was if bizarre. If we're getting interference, it's coming from something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Uh, I mean, you know what? Uh, I'm going to make sure we leave that in uh, all future archives so everybody can hear that uncomfortable pause where we wow. know something was going on. That was trippy. Okay, the law of one. So, I don't know where I gapped out, but I'll just try to pick it up. Um, so, I had been doing research. I'd read 300 books by the time I graduated college in 1995. And then in January of 1996, I found this series of four at the time books. Then it became five later on. They had some deleted material they made a fifth book out of. And I couldn't believe it because this is clearly, if anything ever in my life qualified as higher intelligence, where it was really a higher intelligence that was actually talking to us, this would be it. Right. It read like something, like it, the, the verbiage was so dense that most people can't even get into it because it's just, they have all these weird terms and this unusual jargon, and it speaks at a very, very advanced level. And I was able to get through it only by spending like 45 minutes per page and really meditating on the words and the implications. And what I found was, this is talking about so many things that I thought I had made individual discoveries of that nobody knew before. And yet here it is in this book. And, and by the way, I'm actually writing a book about this part of my life right now. It's called Awakening in the Dream. And that's going to be coming out in August 2017. I just got the contract in the mail. Once I sign it and send it back to them, which I'm going to do at this hotel, that's it. The deal's official. And, I, and I'm due for August 2017 release date, which means i got to write it fast. But right on. this whole part of what I'm talking about right now is what the book's going to be about. I'm going to get way more into the details of the Law of One than I ever have in, in any published book before. So I couldn't believe it, because I get in there, and it's talking about the idea of the global grid, which I thought was a personal discovery I'd made, that 3, 000, all 3,300 ancient stone monuments are all built on one geometric pattern, 
that overlays the Earth's surface, what they call ley lines. There's certain nodes, and those nodes are where planes and ships are portaling out and disappearing. So there's something multidimensional about this geometry on Earth. And I was really into this. I'd read all kinds of great literature on it. I thought I was finding things nobody else had seen before. And I, I became very humbled because this book, this series of books, Law of One, was way beyond the level that I'd taken it. And it was it was literally like stepping into the Vatican Library with an unlimited reading pass. Go go you know, you want to read the stuff from the from the exploded planet before they made it to the moon, before they crash landed on Earth as the fallen angels. You want to read their old books? Here, go ahead. Wow. It was like that. Right, right. I couldn't believe what I was seeing because I was educated enough to know what I was reading and know how true it was. And then the really crazy part was that 11 months after I started reading The Law of One, the source of the material contacted me telepathically. And, and I'd been having dreams for four years by this point, writing them down. And the dream started saying, we want to talk to you. So the tagline on the new book is, what happens when a UFO investigator is contacted by the source that he's investigating? Right. You know, and that led to spoken words that came through me where I was following all the protocols of remote viewing, which means you don't analyze the data, you don't engage it, you don't have any emotional reaction, you just perform the procedure. And in my case, I modified their protocols to cr create verbal information. And I wouldn't really have it. I mean, I have a little bit of a knowledge of what was going on, but not very much. I wouldn't really know what it was until I went back and read it or later transcribed it when I put it on tapes. Right. And it was incredible what was happening. And so the book that I just wrote, The Ascension Mysteries, really doesn't even go into this part at all. I pretty much went right from my early cosmic experiences, recovering from being a heavy-duty marijuana smoker. I was smoking it six times a day. I was really had a problem. And I quit in 1992. I just was one of those people that said, I can't do this at all. That's the only way I'm going to get my life together. And then I kind of go right from that into the story of the insiders that I met and what they told me. And that was my attempt to do full disclosure. And I think I did a bang-up job, and the book's got like 550 reviews on Amazon. They're all almost all five stars. So there's a few haters here and there that go, I don't know why everybody's giving this five stars. It's like, well... And why are you not giving it five stars? You know, maybe because you don't understand it. Or write and it. I, I get it. Right. You know, I mean, right, I, right, I right. did write about some personal stuff in the beginning that's contentious, talking about what it's like to, because I was one of those people that really, really was an addict, where it was like a seriously bad story, like something like a movie that you'd see where it's like, holy crap, how did this guy ever get out of this? You know, he's he's really, really an addict. Well, I was really, really an addict, and there are plenty of people who can use it, use marijuana as medicinal, and it does have medicinal uses. I wasn't one of those. I was one of those who, like, was ruining my entire life, and it was like the train was falling off the tracks. And when I got sober, I said, that's it. I'm not going to do alcohol or coffee or nicotine or anything, and I, and I haven't. And um, so... Again, I'm not trying to preach it, and it's not like I'm trying to tell the reader, don't do drugs. I'm just saying what my experience was, because for me, as soon as I got clean, all kinds of crazy cosmic stuff started to happen. I started to get uh, synchronicities where I, I pray to God and I hold my arms out to the sky, and then this shooting star streaks across the sky when I say, I know you can hear me. And I have this experience like this cosmic energy shooting up my spine. I start having crazy synchronicities. I'm seeing repeating digits on the clocks all the time. I start having all these wild dreams. You know, it's the dreams are talking about ascension, this idea of a quantum leap in human evolution. So by the time I'd found the law of one, I'd been sober for four years. I'd been writing my dreams down for four years. And I'd been researching UFOs for almost four years. And then I, it's like I walk into the treasure room of the greatest stuff there is to know. And... 11 months later, the source contacts me personally. And now I'm actually having a daily interaction with a source that predicts the future as easily as if you would read ahead in a book when you're not on that chapter yet. And, ah, oh, man, now I know what's going to happen in Chapter 17 because I read it. I just couldn't wait. Right. Well, this was that equivalent in my own life in important things as well as mundane things. 
And it's one thing when you have like a deja vu or you have an interesting little synchronicity. Oh, I was just thinking about you, man. There you are. Look at that. It's quite another when you are guided into things that take you and and actually make you real money when you were so poor. I mean, I, I literally had a job in the town I'm staying in now where I worked for $5.77 an hour, two cents above minimum wage, taking care of developmentally disabled people, which included diaper changing. Now, how many people would do that for two years at two cents above minimum wage? Nobody. That's what I did. Yeah, it's so tough. So people tough. are out there saying, oh, David's all about money. Come on. I worked that job for two years because I wanted to help people, because I actually liked it. And the readings started to tell me, David, we don't want you to do this job anymore because it's it, it's it's messing with your consciousness because I was because I had a psychology degree they put me in the most contentious part of the of the whole facility where they isolated all the people with behavior problems so basically my job was like an umpire make sure nobody escapes make sure nobody screams and make sure there's no violence and that's what I did you know for 577 so I got about $200 of take home money per week and so I totally get, you know, people not having very much money. And that's why I'm not selling my stuff at high prices. Guy is $10 a month. You know, I would have totally afforded that even when I was making $200 a week. Right. And I, so I, I'm not out there price gouging. But my point is, when this intelligence came into contact with me, it guided me expertly. It, it told me that I was going to succeed to the degree to which I was able to spiritually evolve. The more spiritual evolution I could have, the farther I would go, and they were going to help me. So I didn't get the luxury of being a jerk. If I was a jerk, and by jerk I mean upsetting people and, and doing things that were self-serving and manipulative, I would hear about it. I would have nightmares. I would cut my finger open with a knife and be bleeding all over my vegetables. I would stub my toe, and then i hear the snap, and, oh, crap, I must have broken a toe. You know I mean? It was like I was seriously getting hammered with karma if I ever walked off the path. And it says in the law of one that once you learn about all this stuff, you become liable. You you become fully liable for your karma. And most people have a, a gratitude where they they're not a, they don't actually have to experience the full thrust of karma because it would overwhelm them and their life would be so negative they wouldn't make any sense out of it. But once you get past that law of grace and, and you, you, there's no grace extended for you because now you know too much, now you've got to be accountable for everything. And so I was trained and I, and I was expertly steered by these various beings, and it ultimately led to all kinds of scientific investigation where I would be guided on a search engine. I'd be looking for one thing, then I'd find something else. And it was through this telepathic link that I was able to create scientific models that greatly exceed our current level of knowledge, but I explain it in terms that plain spoken English can express. I don't use funny, you know, tautological loops of reasoning that are based on jargon and, and kind of weasel wording. If you can't explain it to an eighth grader, it's not true. And that's how I've always tried to approach this. So... I actually did end up stepping away from talking about being in touch with beings or being in touch with this kind of stuff and said, you know, that's not what's going to win this war. People like me, even though I have this access, I need to be out there arguing the facts. I need to argue scientifically because it's like I'm going to court for the future of humanity. You know, what's... That's where my career started to go roughly by about 2006. 2005, 2006, I was already going that direction. It kind of started by 2004, but really by 05, 06, I had kind of stepped away from talking about beings and channeling and all that stuff and trying to get much more scientific. And and as I did, of course, the success level went way up. And, I and, got on Ancient Aliens, I got book deals, all this stuff started to happen. Well, and with that, were you in in this connection and in, in this communication, was it, uh, were they the sphere being alliance? Was it the, that, the bird that was images? That the big cosmic punchline, yeah. yeah. That about, about 10 years after I had turned away from it, it comes back to me. But now, because I'm not really talking to them anymore, and there's a bunch of reasons for that. I, I greatly resented some of the things that I was guided into. I was guided into some initiations that I needed to 
be ready for what I'm doing now uh, that would have flattened me if, if I had had those personality distortions, and there was a variety of them, that I needed to really be very jarringly uh, smashed through. And, and Jimmy, you and I have had personal private conversation. Do not say what it is publicly, but you know what I'm talking about. Right. And I've had horrible stuff. I mean, if right, I told right. the truth, people would be shocked at right. what I've been through. Right, right, right. It's, it's like, the, you know, there's only a few places on earth where you could sit around with a bunch of people and they'd have stories that sound like mine. It's that bad. But I've gotten through it. I have a much better life now. And I have learned to forgive these beings for what they put me through. But while I was still working through that forgiveness and hadn't really gotten there yet, Corey shows up. He spends three months downloading all of his intel to me. We get all of our things put together in in a 150-page document, which became the blueprint for Cosmic Disclosure, the show. And then all of a sudden, he gets pulled back up into the space program for the first time, really since the late 1980s, except for little short jobs that he'd gotten sporadically that he didn't even want, where he was just picked up in the 1990s. All of a sudden, he gets brought back into this world and he becomes an intermediary for these blue avians to interface with the people that had formed an alliance in the space program. And those blue avians, as we now know, they have confirmed through Corey, it took a long time for them to admit it. They were teasing it all along, but they have now admitted they are the authors of the Law of One. They wrote it, that they were the source on the other side of the phone. And so it's interesting that they contacted me, they told me this, they did it by predicting the future in very stunning ways, some of which those prophecies are still very relevant to what's happening right now, and some of which are prophecies that haven't come true yet, and talk about this spontaneous evolution of humanity that we're going through. So it's, it's been a really mystifying and humbling thing to work with Corey, especially because he's having all these really, really, what I would consider to be the most amazingly gratifying, life-changing experiences that I could only wish were happening to me. Well, Apparently, to... they are happening to me, but I'm not allowed to remember them. Right. Very, very bizarre. Well, I'll tell you something uh, that's funny, because you touched upon this a little bit ago when you were talking about the monoliths. And, and when it comes to Arthur C. Clarke, uh, who has definitely... Uh, when he was alive, he had an inside connection to somewhere, right? It, it's obvious, but no question, no question. In, in his Rama series, the leader of the ETs on Rama was a bird dude, right? And I, how about I, that? Yeah, mm. and and it is just, uh, it, it it's beyond words or description. And anybody, uh, I would recommend that go read Rama. And and just trip out on that in Arthur C. Clarke's description of who the leader of the ETs were. Um, they were de- the cabal was definitely using Arthur C. Clarke to push out a lot of disclosure. Yeah, there's there's and, no doubt about that. Um, I, I have yeah, a, Rama is basically an ancient abandoned space station that we find, and you know that's what the whole story is based on. And there are plenty of those that they've actually found. Yes, it's a it's a fascinating yeah. uh, series of books. 